The Holy Gospel for today comes to us from the Gospel according to St. John, reading from the 13th chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. Glory to you, o Lord. When Judas was gone, Jesus said, The Son of Man is now glorified, and because of him, God is glorified. If God is glorified because of the Son of Man, God will glorify the Son of Man because of himself, and he will glorify the Son of Man at once. Jesus said, Dear children, I will still be with you for a little while. I'm telling you what I told the Jews. You will look for me, but you can't go where I'm going. I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Everyone will know that you are my disciples because of your love for each other. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. This past week, as I was preparing for this morning, I was thinking of my dad. And the reason for this was because of the news that it was Queen Elizabeth's birthday. Now, this is significant only because my dad's birthday was on the same day as hers. She was 90 and he was a couple years younger, so had he lived, he would have been 88 this week, which because he passed away in his early 60s, it's hard for me even to imagine him at 88. But I was thinking of him and I was thinking about this, this text and I wanna tell you kind of a, a special but difficult story. My dad was a very private man. He was generally quiet. He kept to himself. He wasn't inclined to any kind of emotional reaction or overreaction. He was conservative. He was traditional. Generally speaking, he was formal. And so, indeed, for those of you who are wondering the reasons for which I am the way I am, it is probably his fault. <laughs> My dad was not someone who was inclined to share his feelings particularly openly. That's just the way that he was. And in fact, during the whole course of my life, generally speaking, he referred to me by my name. He had no terms of endearment, nothing that was a, a familiar thing, just my name. He'd call me Luther. That's the way he was. We did not know that he was sick. He developed lung cancer, and he chose not to tell us, a decision about which um, I'm going to have words with him one day. <laughs> but he chose not to tell us, and it wasn't until the, pretty much the week before he died that I received a telephone call in which I was told that you need to come, dad's been taken to the hospital by ambulance. And so I couldn't go out that night, there was no flight, so I went the next day, as early as I could. And I got there, and he was indeed very sick. He was so sick, in fact, that though over the next few days we were able to talk, it diminished because they were medicating him so heavily that he began to mostly sleep. And so there I was, and I sat by his bed day after day, and I tried to read, I tried to just be present with him, and when he was able to, we would talk a little bit about whatever he felt like talking about. And then on the day before he died, in the last things he ever said to me, he did two things that were very strange. Two things, of course, that I will never forget. He had been sleeping, and I was sitting there reading something, and he stirred. And when he stirred, I became aware of it, and I was going to stand up and, and see if he was okay, if I could talk to him a little bit. But before I actually stood up, he called me. He said, son. He had never done that before. And I stood up and I stood beside him. And then he did the second thing that was very unusual. He took my hand. 
Now, in the days preceding, I had been holding his hand, but he never took my hand. Possibly when I was a little boy, but not since then. He took my hand and he looked me in the eye, and then when he was sure that I was paying attention, he closed his eyes again and he said, very simply, son, take care of your brothers. And he went back to sleep. Those were the last things he ever said to me. I knew that for him, they were important. They were somehow urgent. And he wanted me to remember them. He wanted me to know them. He wanted me to really understand that this was something that was to him an important thing, a priority. There was urgency in his voice. There was urgency in the message that he shared, but it was very simple. There wasn't a long list of anything at all, just a basic message. Son, take care of your brothers. I don't know if he understood what kind of a challenge that task was, <laughs> but that was his message. Now in today's text, we hear this story that has something of the same urgency of these last words, and I want you to reflect on them in this way. I am positive that there are many, many people in this sanctuary today who have had this sacred experience of sitting with a loved one who is dying and hearing the urgency in their voice, hearing their need to share with you something very, very important before they pass away. Have, has anybody had that such an experience? Many of us, I believe, have. And I think that this is what was going on in our text today. Listen to what Jesus said. He's with a group of disciples, and he knows that the end is very near for him. The urgency is not theirs, it is his, because Judas has just gone out of the room, and he knows what that means. Judas is going to betray him. And when Judas betrays him, he knows what's going to happen. He is going to be killed. He is going to die. And so he says, addressing his disciples in a way that he had never before addressed them, he says, and the word in Greek is very clear, my little children, my little children, I'm giving you a new commandment. This was, you must understand, something of a summary of everything that was important that Jesus had shared, and this was his moment to share it because it was urgent, the urgency of his last words. Now, in fact, in John's Gospel, this initiates what we refer to as the passion narrative, the, the, the long kind of preaching that Jesus does before he dies. But here, he abandons his regular methodology of parable. He abandons his teaching mode and gives one very simple, urgent commandment to his disciples. He says to them, love one another as I have loved you. Absolutely brilliant it was. Think of it. For all of us have known this commandment probably since we were toddlers, since we were very young. And it is so simple that even very young children can understand it. Jesus says to us, love one another as I have loved you, addressing us as his little children. There is something profound about this commandment as well, though, because though even little children can learn it and understand it and internalize it, it is so very profound that the most discerning of theologians must look away in embarrassment as we realize how very, very poor we are at achieving it. Think about this for a moment. Jesus gives us one simple commandment, and how many of us are able to do it perfectly? I know that I can't. All Jesus asks of me in the final analysis is love one another. You'd think I could do that but I can't. Somehow or other, I don't. I want to, but I have limitations. I have difficulties. 
I have problems, and so this remains for me something towards which I must strive. It is not simple. Which is why, by the way, it isn't a suggestion. It isn't a recommendation. It isn't just a thought, well, by the way, I really think that if you can, if you have the time, if you want to make the effort, that this would be a good thing for you to do. It isn't that. It is a commandment. Love one another as Jesus has loved us. And our report card in this matter is a little bit lacking. We do our best as a community through acts of love and charity to reach out and to be God's hands and feet in the world, but somehow or other we fall short. It reminds me of uh, a book I read by a fairly famous thinker uh, some of you may have heard of her. She was, in the Catholic tradition, uh, a sister who became a religious studies scholar. Her name was Karen Armstrong. Has anybody heard of her, by any chance? Karen Armstrong wrote some brilliant books. In the, in the 90s, she wrote a book called The History of God, and her last book, which was kind of autobiographical in 2004, I believe, was called The Spiral Staircase. And in that book, she describes how she's learned through her study of the world's religions that there is this commonality about them, and that is this, that faith is not so much a matter of having a list of things to believe, but rather doing things that change who you are. Doing things that change who you are. Jesus didn't say to us, in his last commandment to us. Here's a brief list of the things that you need to believe in order to be saved. He didn't do that. He didn't describe to us doctrinal theology. He didn't describe to us anything at all of that sort. <clears throat> and you might be surprised to know that nowhere in Scripture is it written that unless you are Lutheran, you shall not be saved. Now, some of us sort of think in that direction, and there are some of our Lutheran denominations that actually do sort of push that notion, but it isn't scriptural. What Jesus did say is this. Love one another as I have loved you, and people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So the test, the measure of our discipleship, the success of how good a disciple we are is whether or not people know that we are Jesus' disciples, and they'll know in this way that we show love for one another. And that doesn't mean people you know. That doesn't mean the people that are easy. That doesn't mean the people that are around you, that are close to you, the people that are your friends. It means the people for whom Jesus died. Now that spreads the, the picture a little bit wider it makes it a bit more challenging because there are in that group of people, the people for whom Jesus died, people that you will not like. People that you have decided who are for you something of a problem. But guess what? Jesus died for them. And because Jesus died for them, out of his love for them, we are called upon to love them too. Not like them, not embrace them, not coddle them. We are called upon to love them. A totally different order of affairs. And if we do so successfully, if we do so appropriately, people will know that we are Jesus' disciples. It is almost as if the church today is the church of people who don't want anybody else to know that we are Jesus' disciples because we don't do this love thing particularly well. But when there are times when we can reach out in service and love, sometimes self-sacrificially, to serve God's children in the world, then, brothers and sisters, then people know that you are disciples of the living Christ. As you go out from this place today, I want you to consider this. I want you to think about this. What does it mean to say that we are to love one another as Jesus has loved us. In order to fulfill this commandment, you have to have a sense of what it means to say that Jesus loves you. Do you know what that means? 
Jesus loves you so much that he died for you. He took your place on the cross so that you might have life. Jesus loves you so much that he paid the penalty for your sins so that you might have life. The urgency of his last words was such that he expressed so much in those simple phrases. My little children, he said, children of a beloved parent, my little children, love one another as I have loved you. And if you do, people will know that you are my disciples because you show that you love you have for one another. So, brothers and sisters, go out from this place today and love one another. And if you feel like you're failing, don't worry about it. Keep at it. Keep trying. Loving one another takes time and takes effort. For as long as we are a part of this sinful world, we face such challenges. But the blessing that we have in faithful relationship to God is that Jesus gives us the gift of love. He shows us what that love means and empowers us to love one another. So go out from here and make it happen. Love one another as Jesus has loved us. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks this day for opportunities that you give us to come together, to fellowship, to worship. And most especially this day, we give you thanks for opportunities that you give us to love one another. For loving one another is something that we forget to do. We forget to take seriously. And our friends, our neighbors, our family that we love, we love naturally and easily. But we forget that it is a commandment that you've given us to love all of your children. Help us in this. Guide us in this. So that we might know that we are your children. That we are your disciples. Because of the love that we have for one another. In your name we pray. Amen.